Being together and spending time together, uh, they, they a lot of things together. I just noticed when Ethan got up here, I think he's been hanging out with his mom. <laughs> but I don't know what the story is, Ethan. I'll have to find out later. <laughs> okay, all right. Sounds like a good story. <laughs> all right. We are continuing our series in Ephesians. What a great book. Uh, some, of, some of the commentators, uh, even, even uh, historic ones, have mentioned uh, pound for pound or word for word. The epistle to the Ephesians is one of the, uh, the heaviest, uh, densest, most influential uh, writings in the scriptures. And so there's a lot of material in a relatively short book. And we're, we're marching along at a fairly good clip. Uh, so we're doing, you know, I've, I've told you the plan is the actual sermons on Ephesians. We're, we're pl are planning about 14 or maybe 15. I will let you know I'm probably going to work in a few kind of review or topical ones because we're moving along at a good rate. Um, you and I have both sat under men who spent a lot longer than 14 sermons on Ephesians. So uh, there's a lot more there. And we'll, that's my plan is to come back. Uh, there's a little bit of a breaking point. Just to give you the big picture again here. Uh, at the end of chapter 3, in fact, if you have your Bibles open there, Ephesians 3, the end of chapter 3, you'll notice... Uh, the final word uh, is the word amen, all right? So it is possible. Some of the commentators actually think ver chapters 1 to 3 uh, is uh, essentially a prayer. It's either, it's either four or five prayers kind of interspersed or it's one prayer that's interrupted. We'll see that actually in our text today. But there's a natural breaking point after next week's message. And Lord willing, we'll kind of we'll come back and, and slow down a little bit and look at a few topics or look at a few subject matters for a couple, three weeks. And then, of course, we have Thanksgiving and Christmas mixed in there. And uh, I've preached a lot of Christmas messages. I'm not sure, off the top of my head, I'm not sure I've done one out of Ephesians. So we'll, we'll probably be working out of somewhere else. Uh, so we have those things coming up. But you have that to look forward to. What a great book. I trust, uh, I trust it has been uh, refreshing to you. And uh, this is one that's quite familiar. Any of you who have grown up in the church or been saved for a while, Ephesians is a very typical uh, book to be preached in our churches, partly because one of the great themes is the church. And, so, and that's one of the reasons I uh, picked to work on this now, is just to uh, remind ourselves of some church uh, truths and church principles. And so we want to do that. Also in the big picture, and this is, uh, this is Paul's regular habit, is generally speaking, and it is true here in Ephesians, the first half, so in this case, first three chapters, is primarily doctrinal. Primarily doctrinal. It's teaching, it's laying out who God is, who Christ is, what, what God has done, and so on. Those kind of doctrinal issues. And one of the challenges um, in preaching it is when we preach, we are looking to both inform out of Scripture and then to give you something to do. We want to respond to that. And this is actually, in a sense, teach uh, the teaching aspect, the, the preaching that is mostly doctrinal, which is this section of chapters 1 to 3, there is a different level of, of doing. There's a different level of application, and that is kind of heart-changing, mind-changing. It is, it is recalibrating our thinking on who God is and what he's accomplished. And so it is more foundational. When we turn the page, um, in fact, you, if you're there and your pages are laid out, you can look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 are the more overtly practical. And we'll mention that again when we get there in a few weeks. But you'll notice in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I, I, I urge you then, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk. And that word walk is going to begin to show up a lot in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Walking, of course, meaning in Paul's language, uh, lifestyle, how to live, how to function as a Christian, how to do the Christian things so that God is pleased and we grow and so on. And so it becomes much more uh, practical. It is still doctrinal. It is rooted in, in fact, often you'll see it, He'll teach for a while and then say, therefore, based on what I just said, now do these things. And so that's where we're headed. But let me give you a few things here. Our title this morning in, uh, in Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, which is the next paragraph, it's really the next section, uh, is making uh, the mystery known, the church in God's plan. And so we want to deal with some things. 
I want to cover the, the text um, moving through in order of the verses, so we're, we'll flow in a, in a numeric order, a chronological order in the text, in four points. Uh, point number one is the first verse, uh, the first verse which reads this way, for this reason, because of what I've just been talking about, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And if you have, uh, I'm reading out the ESV this morning, that one has that verse and then a hyphen, a, a dash. And what is going to happen? I'm calling this an interesting introduction. Chapter 3, verse 1, point number 1, interesting introduction. He begins by saying, I'm a prisoner of the Lord for this reason. I, I, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. And then uh, King James, I don't think, has this, but the ESV does a hyphen. What is going to happen, he actually interrupts himself again. And so he, is, he begins, he's just starting to say, I'm a prisoner for, on behalf of you Gentiles, and I want to tell you something. And then he goes into our text today, which is the mystery, uh, which is the church, which is the mystery of Christ. And you'll notice in verse 14, not our text today, but very similar wording, it is not until verse 14 that he stops interrupting himself. All right, so we have verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, a, a, a 12 or 13 verse interruption. And then in verse 14, you notice the wording again. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. And so he comes back to that for the, what he's been discussing. So we're actually in an interlude, if you will. He is beginning or continuing a prayer for the Gentiles, which is in verse 14 and following. But he interrupts himself. So the interesting introduction and, and this, this idea of, of, of being a prisoner... Um, and and uh, this has happened more than once throughout the, the text already. In fact, I mentioned in the, uh, a couple times, some of the commentators, some of the uh, scholars, think the whole f first three chapters is a prayer. And that, uh, that Paul interrupts himself on more than one occasion with a teaching section in the middle of the prayer. Um, it's either that, and I'm not opposed to that, I think it's very possible. If, if it's not that, then he has about three or four prayers in chapters 1 to 3, interspersed with some, some teaching material. In any event, that introduction there in verse 1 is very short. He says, for this reason I want to tell you something, and then he goes on to, on to our text. So the, the main body of the text, we're going to divide into verses 2 through 7, and then verses 8 through 12, and then we'll conclude at the end with verse 13. So let me give you some things out of, out of um, verses 2 through 7. The, the point that, that we would describe it this way is verses 2 through 7 is that God revealed this mystery. He's going to describe a mystery. God reveals this mystery of Christ by grace to Paul and in that sense to us. So God revealed the mystery of Christ uh, to Paul and then to us. So let's pause here for a minute. There are a couple questions that we want to answer in these few verses. Uh, we'll dig into them here in a moment. But for starters, let me, let me introduce this point with the question, what, is, what does Paul mean? What, what is a mystery? So when we talk about what is a mystery, I would, I would suppose that in a group this size, there, there are several of you, maybe quite a few of you, who like a good mystery, all right? I think I've talked to a few of you, uh, either written one, you know, a detective novel, or um, that kind of thing, or a TV series. You know, there have been, through the years, a lot of, a lot of TV series that are, are mysteries. And there's even uh, subcategories of you know, mystery thrillers and all kinds of things. Some of the, some of the shows, um, uh, what was it, Unsolved Mysteries, that, you know, that was on a while ago. And all those kind of things. So when, we, when you and I talk about mysteries, we're typically talking about something like maybe a whodunit kind of thing. You know, a murder mystery. Or um, some kind of unusual phenomena that happened. You know, if you're in, into that kind of thing, UFOs or Bigfoot or something. You know, what's going on with that? That's a mystery. Or something like that. And what we, as, we, as you and I talk in, in our cultures, we talk about a mystery we are typically, what we want to do is solve the mystery. Wouldn't that be a good way to word it? We want to solve the mystery. We want to, we want to figure out, kind of like a riddle or a puzzle. 
and that's all great. I, I agree. I like some of those crime shows and those kind of things too. If you if you enjoy those, I enjoy it. I enjoy it when the bad guys get caught. Um, but anyways, that we enjoy mysteries and we enjoy solving them. Um, but when we come into the text of Scripture, the word mystery is found uh, throughout uh, the New Testament a fair number of times. And so we want to have an understanding of the biblical usage of mystery. It is not the same. It is not, it is not the same. It, so when we talk about mystery, we mean I have, that's a puzzler. I wish we could solve that. Or, hey, did you hear the mystery of the murder of whatever? It just got solved last week. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's a 30-year-old cold case, and it got solved. That is not what Paul means, all right? But he does use the language. Paul himself, I think, uses the term mystery about 20, 21 times in his epistles. And there are quite a few different kinds of mysteries, or different, uh, different mysteries themselves. But what does Paul mean by a mystery? Well, let's look in the text here at a couple of things in verses 2 to 7. Let me read it for you. Um, he says uh, in verse 1, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles, interrupts himself, assuming that you've heard of the dispensation or the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. And here's our key introduction of mystery. Verse 3, here's what I've been given. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. And here is, here's a working definition, and this would be one, this is the main point here, is to understand what is a biblical mystery. A biblical mystery, verse 5, is something which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. Read Old Testament, usually. It's something that was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, that, this, is a, this is a great thing for your Bible reading and Bible study and sermons like this one that you would understand. When we in America speak of a mystery, we mean there's a puzzler. There's some kind of riddle. There's an unsolved case. When Paul talks about it, that is not what he's talking about. He is talking about something, some truth, some fact, some part of God's plan that, in generally speaking, in the Old Testament had not been revealed. It was not known to those people, to the Old Testament saints, and it is now known. One of the key differences for us as mysteries, we try to solve them. The mysteries of the Bible that are labeled mysteries are not things you solve, and you read it here, they are things that God reveals. God reveals them to his apostles and prophets and thus to us. And so he, in the words interchange, he, he does it by revelation or he makes it known. And there are several things like that. Let me give you, a, a, um, rather than go through Paul's stuff, let me give you uh, a different example. So stay, uh, keep your finger here, we'll be back in just a moment. But go with me to Matthew chapter 13. And so this is a non-Pauline use. This is one of Christ's teachings. But in Matthew 13, we have a key turning point. Uh, there, there has been, in the end of chapter 12, there's been a much more formal rejection of Jesus as the king of the Jews by the Jewish leadership, just to set the stage in Matthew. And, um, and in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, this is a pretty well-known passage. This is the passage of the seven parables. There are seven parables here. And it says this, chapter 13, verse 1, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great uh, crowds gathered about him, so they got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, and here's the first one, the sower and the seed, he, and it'll go on from there. So he tells the sower and the seed, there are four soils, and, and the, you, remember the, you remember the story, that's not the point here. But in verse 10, <laughs> drop down to verse 10, then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to these people, to them, in parables? And he answered and said to them, To you it has been given to know what? The mysteries, ESV has secrets, but it's the word, actually the Greek word is musterion. You can, and that's one of those ones you can hear. But uh, ESV has secrets, King James and others have this, the mysteries of the kingdom. All right. So what we're getting at is, what does he mean there? Well, he is, he is giving to them 
uh, not riddles, uh, although parables can be somewhat riddle-ish, but the idea of a, the mystery, the mysteries of the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom, he is telling them information that had not been known in ages past, at least not clearly at all. And he is now giving it to the disciples in this form. One of them, by the way, and I, I haven't figured out if there's, there's seven parables, so I don't know if there's seven secrets here, seven mysteries, or, or if they're kind of repeated. That's a whole other story. But at least one, just to give you an idea, uh, is that there will be a delay. In the, uh, there's a delay between the announcement of the kingdom and its inauguration. I believe that's one of the key ones. So the parables teach us, in the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament saints, men and women who knew the Bible and loved God, uh, look forward to the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom of God. When the Messiah arrived, they expected what? They expected the kingdom would, would be set up immediately. And this is one of the mysteries, that is, a truth that was not revealed in the Old Testament, at least not clearly, and has now been made known or revealed by, in this case in Matthew, by Christ. There is a delay. By the way, that's where we're living. We're in between the announcement of the kingdom and the king coming back and actually sitting on the throne. That was not clear to even the disciples. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And so we have Paul saying, I've been given a stewardship. I've been given a dispensation. And we'll have to talk about some things. here In this text, uh, stewardship or administration, uh, the, the task, the management task of Preaching this truth has been given to Paul. At some point, it couldn't be in our conversations, but at some point in teaching, we do want to deal, develop some things of dispensationalism and covenant theology. It, it does touch into here. It's more than I can, I can do this morning, because uh, we have other, other classes following this. But in any event, in this, in this uh, instance, the word stewardship, or the word dispensation, is that Paul's been given a task, he's, he is the manager uh, before God as an apostle, to preach these things about the mystery of Christ, which is what we're going to develop. But he says this, uh, assuming you've heard of the stewardship, the dispensation of God's grace given to me, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. God revealed it to me. As I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, not made known to the sons of men and other gener generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. So what is a biblical mystery? Something not made known, typically in the Old Testament, but now made known, revealed by God and made known to us. All right, verse number six. This mystery, <clears throat> here it is. This mystery is, it has three parts, but it, it is that God has a plan for the church. God is including us Gentiles in his main plan. Side note, this is part of what dispensationalism is going to deal with. I, again, don't have time to cover that uh, in, this, in this message. But that uh, the church is now uh, God's main focus in this era. This mystery, verse 6, is that the Gentiles are three things. One, fellow heirs members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. There's some amazing things. We talk about uh, this, is, this is church doctrine, this is church truth, this, is, this isn't a teaching of how to run the church or how to set it up, you know, Baptists or uh, Wesleyan or something like that, but this is about the church of Christ that we have three advantages, three things God is doing uh, through the gospel of Christ. One is we are fellow heirs. We're fellow heirs with Israel. We're fellow heirs in the family of God. Second, we, we're members of the same body. And thirdly, we are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, all because of the gospel. Now, throughout, uh, throughout this book of, of Ephesians, one of the interesting things is we, and, and, and we haven't covered this heavily, I've mentioned it, but one of the great phrases Paul uses is being in Christ. That's a doctrinal issue. Uh, that is uh, what you have heard me uh, call a positional issue. Literally, we're in Christ in a theological or spiritual sense. When we are born again, we are placed or put in Christ. We're in that family. We are in him. 
And so Paul develops that. What is interesting, that's a very fundamental issue to understand what it is to be in Christ. The things that come with being in that, in that position, attached to and within Christ. But what we have noticed here along the way, in, in these three chapters now, is that there is also a with Christ, or a, a co-issue. Uh, and so we saw it uh, back in chapter 2, when, when uh, God intervened in our sinful state, he co-quickened us with Christ. Remember that? He, he made us alive together with Christ. In that same passage, he raised us together. He co-raised us. And then he seated us together. He co-seated us. Uh, we looked at another one, I think, last week in chapter 2, uh, where we were uh, made together one body. The two become one in a couple different ways. And again, I find it here in chapter 3, in this description of the mystery, the mystery is that the Gentiles have been united into God's plan and are part of it. And at least in these three ways. He lists these three here in verse, uh, verse 6. We are fellow heirs. We're, we're co-inheritors. There's a, there's a whole, again, a whole segment, a whole section that we need to develop with what it means to be an heir, to be part of the family and be, be lined up to enjoy that which comes with being part of the family. That's a whole discussion, but we're part of that now. The church, Gentiles, who have been brought into Christ by faith, been born again, we are now made co-heirs. Secondly... We, uh, in verse 6, we are also co-members. We are members of the same body. There is a oneness. This is a little bit repetitive from chapter 2, but there is a oneness to the plan of God while we maintain that the church, that's us, is distinct from Israel. Israel is an ethnic group, and we are the church. We're a multi-ethnic group, blended into one. While we maintain that distinction, uh, this is part of dispensationalism, uh, we maintain that distinction between church and Israel, we understand that in God's purposes and in God's big picture plans, we are one people of God. There is a oneness there. And so we are co-members of that same body. And then the third one is also there in verse 6. We are also uh, co-partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. We get to participate in the blessings that come through Jesus Christ. Well, stop for a minute and think about that. We who, remember chapter 2, we who were way far off. We, we were outside of the covenants. We're outside of Israel, outside of everything about God and his plan. We have been brought nigh. And in doing so, that's the mystery. That wasn't really revealed, at least not clearly, uh, in the Old Testament, but we've been brought nigh in God's plan, and we're now in this together as the church. And so there's a great blessing. So what is, what is a mystery? A mystery is something previously not known, not revealed, that is now revealed. All right? It's not just a puzzle or a riddle. It is a fact or truth not known before, but is made known by God, and so it now is known with its, with its implications. And so, uh, what is the mystery here, uh, specifically? Because there are different mysteries. There's some different mysteries. The mysteries of the kingdom and so on. What, what's this mystery? That we are together with Israel. We have been made one in the body of Christ. I want to move uh, on to the next section here. And uh, mention this in the uh, beginning of verse 8. God displays his wisdom, his manifold wisdom through this mystery in the church. In other words, put it in a different way, and I'll read the verses in just a moment. It is the church's uh, reason for existence. It's the church's primary function uh, to display God's wisdom to those around them. Let me read some of these verses. God displays his manifold wisdom through the church. Beginning at verse number 8. Paul says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given... To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Pause there just a second. The unsearchable riches. All the things that are in Christ. Christ the Son of God. In whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Christ the Son of God who is the King of Kings. Christ the Son of God 
who is the Savior, Christ who is the resurrected Lord. All the things that go with that, uh, the firstborn of the dead, uh, the, the unsearchable riches of Christ, Paul says, has been given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This mystery uh, it hangs on, centers in Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan, what is the, the um, this is actually the word stewardship again, the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, here's the key verse I want to get at, verse 10, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I want to draw just a couple simple facts here, very important truths about the mystery which is the church. The mystery here is the church is part of God's plan, and he has pulled us in as Gentiles into his plan, and made it known, and in fact, the church has a big purpose. We're not just here to survive. We're not just here to meet on Sundays, though you know that's our worship day, that this, it's good to be here in worship. But he says the church, it's God's plan that through the church, God's wisdom would be made known, verse number 10, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Well, this, this does two things for me. One is seeing the centrality or the importance, the significance of the church. And again, I know because you're here, I think probably is the saying is I'm preaching to the choir kind of thing. You're here because at some level you think church is important. I'm here to re reassure you and reaffirm that the church is the heart of God's plan for this age. It, he, is, he is all about the church of Jesus Christ. He is all about his church. And so the centrality of that. Secondly, you thought you were coming here just to sing a few songs and as good Baptists, you know, maybe sit towards the back and that kind of thing, right? And Paul says, you know what? The mystery I want to tell you about, the thing I want, that God has revealed to me that I'm telling you, revealing to you is, guess what? The church's job is to reveal God's wisdom all over the place. In fact, not just the people, but the powers and principalities in heavenly places. That's quite a task, isn't it? I, I know I'm not up to it in myself, and I've talked to a lot of you, probably all of you at some point. I'm pretty sure you're not up to that task by yourself either. But in Christ, by the Spirit, that is the role he has given to the church. Its significance as the body of Christ, which will be developed later in chapter 5, but here as the displayer, as, as the entity which will demonstrate to the world, and in the text here, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, God's manifold wisdom. What a thing to think about, the, the importance, the significance of the church. And so the mystery is the church is included in God's plan. The further development of that is the purpose for that is that the church might display God's wisdom. What it tells me, we got to, you know, I think we are serious about church, but we ought to stay serious about church. We ought to celebrate church. We ought to make it very much the center of our lives and to learn uh, the things of Christ so that we can display the wisdom of God to the people around us and even to the, as it says in verse 10, to the rulers and authorities uh, in the heavenly places. That is our task. I close with verse 13, and again, you notice in verse 14, he actually is going to get, he tie, verse 14 ties back to verse 1. He gets back to that. But he says in verse 13, therefore, uh, ESV just says the word so, but therefore, based on what I've just told you, I ask, so we're kind of, we're, we're into some thinking or some application kind of things. Uh, I ask, therefore, that you not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. Paul briefly here says, uh, I, I am suffering some things. There's some troubles and trials that I'm going through. Probably referring to verse 1 where he says, I'm a prisoner. All right? this, Ephesians is one of, of the four prison epistle books. He is writing this from prison. 
And, and it's on behalf of his ministry for Christ, for the saints. And so he's saying, for that, you know, I'm suffering. I'm in, I am in prison. But he says, even though something bad, something troublesome, something a- afflictive is happening to me for you, here's what I ask. Because of what I've just described, the mystery of the importance of the church and God's plan, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. And so the, the concluding consideration here would be to look at the big picture. Look at the big picture that he has just described. Uh, bring it into focus that the church is God's plan for this age. Uh, the church is central to his mission. The church is on a mission to uh, display God's wisdom, even in the heavenlies, to the beings in the heavenlies. And then it brings it down to a personal level. Uh, God's purpose and plan in and through the church applies to us individually. We ought to be excited about the church. We ought to be faithful to the church. We ought to get uh, serving more. And I know many of you are already doing that. So I'm, again, preaching to the choir. Uh, but this, uh, this issue of, I ask you, based on what I've described, the mystery, which is Christ, uh, the, the church of Christ being part of God's plan. I ask you not to lose heart. God is at work. And so we want to focus on that. Take your hymn books, if you would. And we're going to sing um, a song to close this morning.